On January 28, 1986, the NASA shuttle Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into its flight, killing all seven crew members, which consisted of five NASA astronauts and two payload specialists. The disaster resulted in a 32-month break in the shuttle program and the formation of the Rogers Commission, a special commission appointed by President Reagan to investigate the accident. Approximately 17% of Americans witnessed the launch live because of the presence of payload specialist Krista McAuliffe, who would have been the first teacher in space. Media coverage of the accident was extensive. One study reported that 85% of Americans surveyed had heard the news within an hour of the accident. Reagan abandoned the Eisenhower-era Cold War strategy of mutually assured destruction and replaced it with the new policy of peace through strength. This meant that the U.S. would increase spending on defense. Money was invested in new weapon systems like the B-1 bomber, MX missile, increased number of ships in the Navy, and SDI, or Strategic Defense Initiative. SDI, nicknamed Star Wars, was a missile defense system in space that would knock out Soviet missiles. The effect was to bankrupt the Soviet Union as they tried to match our missile defense systems. There were new communist threats in Central America. The tiny nation of El Salvador was of particular concern to American leaders. Since 1979, communist-led rebels had been battling the government in a bloody civil war. Reagan responded by persuading Congress to send aid to the anti-communist government. American officials believed that the Salvadorian guerrillas were getting arms from neighboring Nicaragua. The U.S. then cut off aid to Nicaragua in the spring of 1981, accusing the Sandinista government of welcoming Cuban and Soviet assistance and serving as a supply base for leftist guerrillas in nearby El Salvador. In April of 1983, Reagan asked Congress for the money and authority to remove the Sandinistas from power in Nicaragua. When Congress, fearful of another Vietnam, refused, Reagan opted for covert action. The CIA began supplying the Contras, exiles fighting against the Sandinistas, from bases in Honduras and Co Costa Rica. The U.S.-backed rebels tried to disrupt the Nicaraguan economy, raiding villages, blowing up oil tanks, and even mining harbors. Then, in 1984, Congress passed the Bolin Amendment, prohibiting any U.S. agency from spending money in Central America. The withdrawal of U.S. financial backing left the Contras in a difficult position. In October 1982, the administration sent American soldiers and Marines into the tiny Caribbean island of Grenada to remove an anti-American Marxist regime that showed signs of forging a relationship with Moscow that would enable the Soviets to establish a new strategic military base in the Americas. The name of the military operation was Operation Urgent Fury. In the 1982 midterm elections, Republicans lost the majority in the House and the Senate to the Democrats. Soon after taking control, Democrats passed the Bullen Amendment, making it nearly impossible for Reagan to support the anti-communist Contras in Nicaragua. Reagan instructed his national security advisor, Robert McFarlane, to find a way to find help for the Contras. Meanwhile, Iran and Iraq were engaged in a bloody war. Iranian terrorists were holding seven Americans hostage in Lebanon. McFarlane made a deal with Iran to sell them anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles to provide funding to secretly equip Contras in Nicaragua. This was a violation of the Bolin Amendment. Oliver North, a young Marine lieutenant, was put in charge of moving the funds from the sale of, to the Contras in Nicaragua. North's ploy was clearly not only illegal but unconstitutional, since it meant usurping the congressional power of controlling funding. The Tower Commission investigated the administration's involvement and concluded that Reagan's lack of oversight enabled his administration to send the money to the Contras. The Iran-Contra affair did serious damage to the Reagan presidency. Even though the investigations were ne never able decisively to tie the president to himself to the most serious violations of the law, domestically the scandal precipitated a drop in Reagan's popularity as his approval rating saw the largest single drop for any president in history from 67% to 46% in 1986. The Reagan Doctrine supported opponents of communism anywhere in the world, much like the Truman Doctrine, whether or not the regimes or movements were challenging it or had any direct connection to the Soviet Union. In Afghanistan, the U.S. provided limited military assistance to the Mujahideen, a group of Muslim guerrilla warriors, in an effort to drive the Soviets out of the country. The CIA supplied them with Stinger missiles, which proved to be the turning point in the war. 
The Reagan Doctrine would lend U.S. support to anti-communist resistant movements in Soviet allied nations in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Reagan chose nine nations for rollback. Afghanistan, Angola, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Iran, Laos, Libya, Nicaragua, and Vietnam. Rollback became the basis of the Reagan Doctrine. Reagan's covert action program has been given credit for assisting in ending the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. The largest resistant movement fighting Cambodia's communist government was largely made up of members of the former Khmer Rouge regime, whose human rights records were among the worst of the 20th century. Therefore, Reagan authorized the provision of aid to a smaller Cambodian resistance movement, a coalition called the Khmer People's National Liberation Front, known as the KPNLF, in an effort to force the end to Vietnamese occupation. Eventually, the Vietnamese withdrew and Cambodia's communist regime fell. Reagan hoped to achieve the other Camp David objective of providing a homeland for the Palestinian Arabs on the West Bank, but Israel instead continued to extend Jewish settlements into the disputed area. The threat of the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, based in southern Lebanon and frequently raiding across the border into Israel, seemed to be the major obstacle to further progress. On June 6, 1982, Israel invaded southern Lebanon in order to secure its northern border and destroy the PLO. The Reagan administration made no effort to halt the offensive, but did join with France and Italy in sending a multinational force to permit the PLO to evacuate to Tunisia. Unfortunately, the U.S. soon became uh, involved in the Lebanese Civil War, which had been raging since 1975. American Marines sent to Lebanon as part of a multinational force to restore order were caught up in the renewed hostilities between Muslim and Christian militia. The Muslims perceived the Marines as aiding a Christian-dominated government of Lebanon instead of acting as neutral peacekeepers, and they began firing on the vulnerable American troops. Reagan declared that they were there to protect Lebanon from the designs of Soviet-backed Syria. But finally, after terrorists drove a truck loaded with explosives into the American barracks in Beirut, killing 239 Marines, Reagan saw no choice but to pull out. The last American unit left Beirut in late February 1984. Reagan announced after the Beirut bombings that he would not negotiate with terrorists. From the embassy bombing and the attack on the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, a time bomb detonation in the U.S. Senate building, a cruise ship hijacking the Achille Lauro, a German discotheque, and numerous airline hijackings and bombings, the most famous being Pan Am Flight 103 over Scotland, TWA Flight 840 in Athens, Greece, and TWA Flight 847 in Cairo, Egypt. Americans were finding themselves more and more frequently targeted by terrorists. Most of the terrorists hailed from Libya or had Middle Eastern roots with terrorist groups such as the PLO or other extremist groups who opposed U.S. policy in Israel. Reagan sent a message that was loud and clear in retaliation for the strikes on Americans in a Berlin discotheque in 1986 when he sent two airstrikes to Libya to bomb the headquarters of Muammar Gaddafi. President Reagan waged a verbal war against the Soviet Union, calling it the Evil Empire. In his first term, Reagan drastically increased military spending, ramping up the arms race to put pressure on the Soviets and increased Cold War tensions. In 1985, a new leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, came to power and knew the USSR could not compete with the U.S. defense budget. He wanted to lessen Cold War tensions with diplomacy. He hoped this would lead to a cut in military spending. Gorbachev was also open to making changes in his country to make things better. This meant he was open to discussing social problems inside the Soviet Union. This was known as Glasnost. This led to what is known as perestroika, a restructuring of Soviet society, especially the economy. He let private citizens own land, allowed more free speech, and held some free elections. Now it was only a matter of time before communism fell in Europe. Thanks to Gorbachev's leadership and diplomacy with President Reagan, the U.S. and Soviet Union signed the INF Treaty in 1987. The INF Treaty eliminated American and Soviet intermediate range nuclear forces from Europe, the most significant arms control agreement of the nuclear age. At about the same time, Gorbachev ended the Soviet Union's long and frustrating military involvement in Afghanistan. By the time Reagan left office in January of 1989, he had scored a series of foreign policy triumphs that offset the Iran-Contra fiasco and thus helped redeem his presidency. <laughs>
The significance of Reagan's foreign policy is that he seized the opportunity to end the Cold War, regardless of whether it was because of his policies, which strained the Soviet budget, or whether it was the effects of containment and the reforms of Gorbachev. 